Dr. Tom Jones is a scientist, author, pilot, and former NASA astronaut. He holds a doctorate in planetary sciences, and in more than 11 years with NASA, he won four space shuttle missions in Earth orbit, uh, which is quite a few, and I'm sure Tom agrees that that's quite a few missions. Uh, on his last flight, Dr. Jones led three spacewalks to install the centerpiece of the International Space Station, the American Destiny Laboratory. He has been privileged to spend 35 days working and living in space. I'm sorry, 53 days. Uh, Tom has, has published either authored or co-authored six books, two of which we have for sale out here, Skywalking for $20 and uh, Planetology for $25, both hardcover. And Tom uh, will, will sit around and autograph uh, things to anyone's participation. Uh, Tom is currently a member of the NASA Advisory Council and is active in the debate over our nation's future space exploration policies. He consults, writes, and speaks from Houston, Texas. Please welcome Dr. Tom Jones. Thank you so many people from the Space Center and from the, uh, the space flight community here in Houston. Uh, many, many, many people here have helped me in my job in the past, and I hope I can at least entertain you <coughs> this evening by way of uh, a return. Uh, also, great to see so many people here from around the, the community, and also so many folks from out of town who are here with the educator groups on the uh, uh, zero-G flights coming up this week. So that's just marvelous. I wish I could be going with you. You're in for a real treat. Uh, let me talk about my uh, subject for this evening just a bit to introduce this. Uh, a wonderful shot of uh, our Earth seen from space. And this photograph was taken 40 years ago, just last month, uh, by the Apollo 8 crew. And I was 13 years old when the Apollo 8 guys flew, and I know that we have at least a couple of people here in the audience who helped make that mission a reality. <laughs> Glenn is in here somewhere, he's in the audience. Those who, those who sent the Apollo 8 guys to the moon did something that was just magical. And as a, a young person watching this event unfold on television, I was so impressed uh, with this first launch of human beings out of Earth's gravitational grip out to another body in the solar system. And on December 21st, they launched from Cape Canaveral uh, on the first flight of the Saturn V. Three days later, they got to the moon. And they went into orbit around the moon, the first human beings to go into orbit around another body and look down with their own eyes at close range at another world. And of course, it was marvelous for us here on the ground. It was especially moving for those up there, uh, Frank Warman, Jim Lovell, and uh, Bill Anders. And I spoke on the same stage with Bill Anders back in September and heard his story about how they saw the Earth for the first time. In an interview he did that I excerpted here, uh, he talks about how uh, they were going around on their third lunar orbit. They'd been photographing the landscape below and describing it on the radio to the people back here, mission control and around the world. And then Orman looked out the window as the Earth rose above the lunar horizon. And I'll get you to that photo in just a second. So, you recognize this famous photo that the crew took. Warman looked out the window and saw the Earth rising above this blasted surface, and he says, wow, look at that. And they saw this first Earth rise that they had been conscious of on their trips around the moon. And uh, he had a black and white camera, Warman, and snapped a few pictures, but he recognized what a, a great image this was. So he had Bill Andrews from Color House of Black take his picture on the right. Uh, and it's now known as Earth Rise, and it's probably the most famous picture from the entire Apollo program, and, and perhaps even the entire space program. Uh, Anders said in, the, in an interview that, I instantly thought that it was ironic that we'd come all this way to study the moon, and yet it was this view of the Earth that was one of the most important events for Apollo 8. And he went on to say that there were basically two things that came to me, Anders said. One of them is that the planet was quite fragile. It reminded me of a Christmas tree ornament. But the other message is one uh, that to me was new, and I don't think anyone has really, it's really sunk in yet, and that's that the Earth is really small. We're not the center of the universe. We're way out of left field on a tiny dust moat, but it's our home, and we need to take care of it. And it wasn't long after the crew returned to Earth that everybody within NASA, including the astronauts, and millions around the world began to realize that this image represented an icon for the budding environmental movement back then. And Ender says, back in the 60s, it gave us a sense that the world was a place that 
we all shared together. We couldn't see any boundaries from the moon. And of course, a lot of my colleagues who've flown in space, even just a couple of hundred miles up, rather than a couple of hundred thousand miles up, have the same impression of, of a world without boundaries. It's such a, a beautiful planet. And so that's the subject of my talk tonight, is a, a glimpse at our own world uh, set in the context of the solar system. And uh, uh, here's an overview of what I'm going to be speaking about. Examples from the book, of course. I'll share a few photos from the pages of Planetology. Uh, some other photos that aren't in the book that speak to subjects that uh, are, are covered there, but are images that are even more favorites of mine. Uh, also, I'll tell you a few stories from orbit that relate to the study of our world and the worlds of the solar system. Uh, an astronaut has a unique perspective on the world, and I'd like to share some of that joy with you. And finally, uh, I'll tell you about uh, our Earth now I see it as a home, of course, for all of us, but it's also our classroom for the exploration that we're trying to embark upon here in the 21st century, in the coming decades, uh, and, and this, uh, I think, a century of exploration that's to come. So let me roll into this for about 45 minutes, and there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end, and I'll share with you some impressions of, of uh, our world and its neighbors in the solar system. Well, this is a good slide to start on. It puts our world in context. There's three nearby neighbors in the solar system, of course. Uh, Venus on the left, Mars on the right, almost to the right scale in terms of their actual sizes. Uh, why is our Earth an abode for life and curiosity and ambition and imagination? And why is Venus on the left a world that's got a surface temperature of 900 degrees Fahrenheit, even though it's the same size as Earth and it's only a little bit closer to the sun? Why is Mars on the far right uh, smaller than Earth, but why is it now so desiccated and dry when it once was a wet, hospitable world for, perhaps, life? Why do these planets take different evolutionary paths? And of course, that's the whole business of comparative planetology, comparing one world to another, finding out why their histories are similar, why they've diverged, and what factors in space or in our universe made them turn out this way. It's a close-up of uh, our planet seen from the space shuttle on my third flight on Columbia, SDS-80. And from above, the world looks very serene, almost completely unchanging from orbit to orbit to the astronauts' view. Uh, there's no sound in space, of course, so you see the silent blue or rolling beneath you orbit after orbit. And you tend to forget while you're up there for a few weeks uh, that it's one of the most dynamic planets that we know about, even though it looks so beautiful and serene. So here we are on the northern coast of Australia, uh, the continent to the south, the waters of the Pacific Ocean, the Coral Sea, and New Guinea off to the right of the picture. So wonderful to look out the window to relax at the end of the day. And from a distance of 220 miles in this photo, tend to forget how dynamic the world it really is. Of course, there's all the machinations of human beings that neglect wire up there in space. But there's also the dynamism of the world itself and all the processes that work on it. Here's a shot of an erupting volcano that National Geographic shared with us of the Chaitin volcano in Chile that erupted this past spring. And that pumice cloud being blasted into the sky was so highly charged with static electricity that you have this gigantic lightning storm breaking out this dramatic photo. So everywhere you look around the world close up, uh, you can see evidence of how dynamic the world is. In September, we saw the, the work of Hurricane Ike. Now that can change the landscape in just a few hours. Here in Houston. Sir? Yes? Is it possible to lower the house lights? And I think it would be easier to see. Thank you for the suggestion. Sorry to interrupt. And of course, around the world, we encounter news of earthquakes, typhoons, and volcanic eruptions like this to show us that this world is a place to change. That's the one constant that we see on Earth, and that's, of course, the one constant throughout this universe of ours. Now, if you look around the world from the space shuttle in another, another direction, you'll see the roof of the world, the Tibetan Plateau, at the top of this picture. And uh, you can also see the chain of the Himalaya, all snow caps. And this photo was taken in uh, the late fall of uh, 1996. So you can see it's early winter there. And then this is the mighty Brahmaputra River, 
which flows around the edge of the Himalaya and all the way down to the Indian Ocean where it joins the Ganges to make the largest river delta in the world. And this is a picture which again looks rather peaceful, but it's uh, a world in constant motion, in constant struggle. The Himalaya are being uh, driven upwards by the collision of the Indian subcontinent with the Eurasian plate up here. And the, the mountains there are rising somewhere on the order of a centimeter every year by this massive plate collision tectonics and what that work. And then the erosive process caused by ice and snow at the heights, and then water, melt water and rainwater on the foothills of the Himalaya is cutting down to this mountain range in the Himalaya at almost the same rate, about a centimeter per year of erosion in the river valleys that's occurring, and driving those valleys deeper into the heart of the Himalaya. And the Brahma Putra is, of course, a conveyor belt that's taking all of that gravel and sand away from the mountains and then out to sea constant struggle for altitude versus erosion uh, in this uh, roof of the world. And it's just a wonderful place for astronauts to contemplate uh, the process of change over the long term of our planet. Well, if Earth is such an active planet, what's been going on with our neighbors in space? And our nearest neighbor, of course, is the moon. This weekend, if you look out at the full moon, you'll notice maybe it's about 10 or 15 percent bigger. It's uh, close, a little closer to us because it's closer in its orbit, it's the perigee of the orbit this weekend of the full moon. So I might look a little bit brighter to you. The picture of binoculars out, we'll start to see the craters on the surface that the Apollo astronauts saw on Apollo 8 and all the other missions. This is an Apollo 16 photo of uh, the far side of the moon as well as some of the near side up here. And of course you notice it's just hot with craters. And as the early astronomers looked up in the sky, they wondered what process shaped the surface of this world versus that of our own. And that's the way we've organized, Alan Stefan and I, uh, our book, Planetology. We've organized it not by planet. There's not a chapter on Earth and a chapter on Venus and a chapter on Mercury. There's a, a chapter instead on each process that shapes the solar system. So we will talk about impact in this case and the story of tectonics in another chapter. And then, of course, the story of life and our search for it across the galaxy as the end of the book. So we've taken the solar system apart by process or force, if you will, to give you a good look at the comparisons that we can make uh, with our own planet and the worlds that surround it. Now, of course, until the early 60s, when the Apollo program got underway, there was a lot of argument among geologists about what made these pock pockmarks on the moon. One camp said volcanic uh, activity. Of course, we see volcanic craters all over our own world. And another camp said these were certainly caused by the impact of asteroids and meteorites or comets in some cases. And the traces of those impacts are then reported in the, the uh, crust of the moon. It wasn't until the early 1960s that uh, one of the geologists involved with the Apollo program, Gene Shoemaker, went out as a young uh, geologist to Meteor Crater in Arizona and took apart this crater geologically, studied the bedrock, studied the strata or rocks around the rim, and figured out with certainty that this had certainly been not a volcanic eruption, as many have thought, but uh, an impact of a, a cosmic object. It turns out that about 50,000 years ago, uh, an object about 75 meters across slammed into the desert in Arizona. That nickel iron object vaporized on impact and created this nearly mile wide crater. It's about 4,000 feet across, about uh, 600 feet deep. And the record of that impact 50,000 years ago was written into the very crystals of the minerals in the bedrock around this crater. And that proved conclusively that a uh, meteor crater, as many other impact scars on our planet, was caused by a cosmic process of impact over the age of the solar system. This is the best preserved impact crater on Earth, but of course in that lunar image you saw thousands of craters, which of course marked the surface of the moon down in very small scales. When the Apollo astronauts got there a few years later, they confirmed Shoemaker's findings, of course, by uh, collecting samples of the debris thrown out from these impact craters. This is one of the Apollo astronauts on Apollo 17, standing next to the rover and next to Shorty Crater. Shorty Crater was about, uh, I think it's something about 85 meters across. And so the, the depth would be about 20 meters, about 60 or 50 feet deep. Just a small, far meter landing site, but it gives the astronauts a way to probe beneath the surface of the moon by collecting debris thrown out by these impacts. And of course, everywhere we look at the solar system, this impact process is at work on the surface of Mars, the uh, 
spacecraft already have planned to look down from Mars reconnaissance over in this case and see the outline of the rim of Victoria Crater, which was explored recently by the rover Opportunity, which actually drove down into the crater floor on the sand dunes and then back out. And that journey by the rover Opportunity, which is now starting its sixth year of exploration on Mars, gave us a close up look at the bedrock and the walls of this crater, just as the Apollo astronauts visited the moon. And in the bedrock of the Victoria Crater, we see the traces here, the layers of sandstone created out of ancient sand dunes on Mars. Uh, traces of the climatic past of Mars, certainly, but also evidence of what lies beneath the surface that you can't see if you're just driving around uh, on the, the dusty plains above. So impact craters are our boreholes into the past of the planet. And on Mars, we've begun to duplicate the process that we began on Earth that I've studied geology here in the past couple of centuries. And of course, craters are everywhere. I mentioned there are about 180 craters that we discovered on the surface of our own Earth from the impact process. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, so if you look at uh, the Chesapeake Bay region here, you can see that 35 million years ago, we had a large impact event at the mouth of the modern Chesapeake Bay. Back then, the Atlantic washed the shores of the Appalachian Mountains the shoreline was a lot farther inland than it is today. Uh, the Appalachians were quite a bit younger and taller at that time. And when this shallow sea was hit by this uh, asteroid impact, it created a crater that's nearly 60 miles across at the uh, mouth of what's today Chesapeake Bay. Uh, the crater is totally buried by sediments today. It's not evident at the surface at all, but boreholes, uh, in terms of geological exploration, being done here looking for freshwater supplies, looking for mineral resources, Drilling found the traces of impact in this buried crater and then discovered its boundaries. So this event, as you see outlined here by a gravity map, shows you that even below the surface, our Earth has been marked by this cosmic impact process. And it's been going on for four and a half billion years in our solar system, and it still continues today. And if you look at this photo, on the lower right, you see a fireball that penetrated the Earth's atmosphere just in early December over the state of Colorado. And this fireball was no bigger than the size of an office desk, this, this uh, impact rate. So it burned off harmlessly in the atmosphere 50 miles up. Uh, on the space shuttle, when you look down at night at our Earth, you watch the shooting stars below you as these little sand grains fly in from space and burn out in the atmosphere. Uh, never saw anything that bright, of course, while I was looking down at, at the uh, night side of the Earth. But that process of small debris hitting the Earth goes on all the time, 100 tons per day are collected by the Earth as it orbits the sun. And occasionally, a larger rock will run into us, one meteor crater, or even that Chesapeake Bay impact. Uh, what kind of rocks are they? Well, they're a lot like this asteroid Itakawa, a near-Earth object, a near-Earth asteroid that was visited by the Japanese spacecraft uh, Hayabusa just a couple of years ago. And this one's about the size of the Lion Stadium. So these objects are out there. Some of them come close to the Earth. Eventually, with certainty, one like this, one smaller, one larger, will run into us again. How big a problem is that? Geologically, it's an interesting phenomenon because it shapes the surfaces of all the planets. But for we humans, is it a hazard? That's one of the topics that I work on today is the hazard from asteroid impacts and whether or not we should be doing anything to prevent them in the future. Here's a snapshot of our solar system taken from an observatory over in Europe. And it's a snapshot that's accurate as of today. Uh, this is a, the near-Earth object neighborhood of our inner solar system. Here's the sun at the center of the diagram. And Mercury is in this Earth's orbit right here. And then Mars. Beyond Mars, some of you know, there's the main asteroid belt. That's all these green objects that circle harmlessly for the most part between Mars and Jupiter. But collisions in the asteroid belt and the influence of Jupiter's gravity send a lot of these objects eventually into orbits that cross those are the planets in the inner solar system. The yellow dots are called the Amor objects that don't quite come in as far as Earth's orbit, but they come close. And then the red, and, uh, the red dots here are near Earth objects that actually cross Earth's orbit and represent the future collision, collision hazard to our planet. So we might think that space is pretty empty, and I counted on that when I was a shuttle astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the solar system, even our Earth orbit is shooting gallery that we fly through every day. Here's a statistical layout of 
the objects that we've discovered so far by telescopes from Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, the number of asteroids that have been discovered in near object uh, population, and the year across the bottom. So NASA has been searching for all the objects that are bigger than a kilometer across, about six tenths of a mile across, because those are the ones that can run into us and actually uh, damage the ecology of the world or, or cause regional or global changes in the climate if they run into us. And so under that program, NASA has been discovering a lot of near Earth objects over the last decade. The process is nearly complete for those large objects. Uh, all the asteroids, near Earth asteroids, are in blue. The large ones that in the kilometer are in red. About 800 of the large ones have been discovered. None of them are headed for Earth in the near future. Not, not in the next century, certainly. But as of uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, out of the 6,000 near Earth objects or so that we know about, uh, we have a category, a subcategory called potentially hazardous asteroids. About a thousand of them come within about 500 to an astronomical so even about 5 million miles from the Earth in their future orbits. And they may, in future orbital evolution, come close enough to run into the Earth uh, in future decades. And of those potentially hazardous objects that are bigger than a kilometer, there are about 140 of those. So these are ones that are on the watch list. None of them are headed for us right now, but they could be nudged by gravitational perturbations or a collision and wind up hitting us someday. So the good news is nothing's headed our way, except for those desk-sized objects we see throughout. The bad news is that we're going to get a lot smarter in the next 10 years about this process of impact and the process of discovering near Earth objects. And new telescopes like the PanSARS over in Hawaii and a future telescope called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope and it comes online as an 8 meter mirror, they're going to find about half a million near Earth objects by about 2020. Instead of the 6,000 we know today, we're going to about half a million. And that means that some subset of that group is going to be on that potentially hazardous list. And so that's what we have to be concerned about. Sometime in about 2015 or 2020, we're going to know about a couple of dozen objects that have a non zero chance of striking the Earth. They'll be at various sizes, most of them will be small. But we'll have the prospect of something half a kilometer in size, like Hitakawa, coming dangerously close to the Earth. What should we do about it? You can see on the scale of the space station, these are rather massive objects. And if one of them would strike the Earth, for example, Apophis in 2036, which has a 145,000 chance of getting us. That's a 400 megaton explosion. If it struck the Earth, <coughs> even though the odds are tiny, if it struck the Earth, it would be a global disaster. So what do we do about that? It turns out that my organization called the Association of Space Explorers, it's the alumni group for the astronauts around the world, we submitted a plan recently to the United Nations in September, suggesting a, an agreement that the international community might sign on to as to what to do to plan to prevent a future impact. This is Ghost's Bluff in Australia, an ancient impact star. But we don't want to see this process happen again. And so the suggestions were made to the UN, that dynamic, fast-moving body, <laughs> are to start talking now, knowing how slowly the wheels turn there, start talking now about decision-making in the face of an asteroid impact, so that if it actually occurs or confronts a subject with a non-zero chance, we'll have a plan in place and not a panic stricken reaction. We're talking now about dealing with hazards like the Tunguska events in the lower right here that uh, happened 100 years ago. That was about a 5 to 10 megaton blast, something actually smaller than 5 megatons now. It's thought to be the size of the explosion. But it blew down 2,000 square kilometers of forest. And of course, Canada being a rather ancient landscape in terms of plate tectonics, has a lot of impact stars. The people that crater the Quebec is a, a nice example of an ancient star of the northern hemisphere. But if we are confronted by a city-busting event like Augusta in the future, what would we do? And our suggestion to the UN in our document, uh, our report says that we should have a warning system, information sharing from that warning system. We should also have a, a body sponsored by the UN that does mission planning to conduct a spacecraft mission to nudge a hazardous asteroid out of its orbit away from the collision with Earth. And we should also think about uh, a way to have an executive authority that authorizes the space and countries of the world to use their spaceflight capability to undertake an asteroid deflection mission. 
And right now, the only part of that whole system, warning and uh, discovery, mission planning, and execution authority, the only part of that that exists today is the telescope warning program that NASA largely funds. None of the other components are in place. And it's going to take an international response to get everybody to buy in to action against a future asteroid threat. And we have a lot of launch vehicles that are coming along in the future that we can use for uh, going to a NEO, both with astronauts and uh, with robotic vehicles that reflect an asteroid. And uh, we've got some capabilities. We actually have the tools to stop a process that's been operating around the solar system for billions of years, if we actually collectively decide to do that. So the hope is that in about uh, two or three years, the UN will come out with a product that the General Assembly can adopt that will authorize future discussions of an asteroid deflection mission to prevent an event like uh, Tarkovsky from occurring on Earth in the future. Well, that leads me to my next little topic having to do with impact, and that is the desirability of sending human explorers out to these objects that are a hazard to us, but also represent a possible resource in terms of exploration, in terms of our ability to spread out into the solar system as a species. NASA, of course, is planning to go back to the moon, uh, not with the old Apollo 8 Saturn V rocket, but with new vehicles that it's developing, you know, the Ares 1 crew launch vehicle and the big Ares 5 cargo rocket that will eventually return Americans to the moon. There are variations on that large vehicle that might occur. And we also have satellite launchers that are pretty hefty in terms of their capability. And I was lucky enough to be on a study team over the last couple of years that NASA sponsored. We have some members of the group in the, in the audience tonight, my colleagues uh, Paul Abel and Rob Langs and Dan Gombo is over here. Uh, these folks worked with me under NASA's leadership to study whether we might be able to send astronauts aboard the new Orion spacecraft out to a near Earth object in the next 10 to 15 years. And so it turns out, a surprising result to us, I think, that uh, the, the spacecraft that we're building to go back to the moon actually has enough deep space capability, it's not the legs, to actually visit some of the nearby objects that come close to the Earth from the other reaches of the solar system. Objects like Itakawa could be visited by an astronaut crew if they were willing to sign up for a mission that would last anywhere from three to six months. So let's see those hands again. And uh, look at the person next to you in the audience. Would you spend six months in an object the size of the old uh, Apollo capsule? Or the old asteroid? Do some real thinking about whether to make that decision or not. But if you can find somebody that you're a simpatico with, and you want to sign up for an Orion mission to an asteroid, here's one way that that object, uh, that uh, objective might be attained. Uh, Dan drew up this trajectory plot for us as part of our study. Here you see the asteroid 1999 AO10, a small object that periodically visits the vicinity of the Earth. And you see its orbit right here, uh, passing by the Earth in the year 2025. And we uh, talked about this as a possible mission profile. It's pretty typical of the ones that we discovered. In the case of a mission to an object that would launch from Earth, uh, head out and intercept the asteroid as it was coming by, and you'd spend a couple of weeks on the asteroid doing field exploration, sampling that object, understanding its bedrock, its civil engineering structural properties, if you will, so you had to nudge it away someday and understand how to do that. And then you'd uh, depart, here's the outbound leg, you travel on the asteroid, and then return to Earth on that leg. And the whole mission would take something on the order of September to uh, February of the following winter. So 2025 to early 2026. Turns out the rocket requirements for doing that mission are within the capability of what the Orion system, the constellation system should have. So it's feasible for human explorers to follow up in the robotic footsteps that have taken place already and that will occur in the future and actually visit some of these objects that can not only do us harm but also represent opportunities for us in exploration of the solar system. Here's an arts concept of what a touchdown on a near Earth object might look with Orion or constellation vehicles. Maybe a modified lunar lander could be used to give you extra living room. And you might enjoy this perspective looking back from five hundredths of an astronomical unit, that's about five to ten million miles away, how big would the Earth look from that distance? Standing on the sur surface of an asteroid, you'd see not what the Apollo 8 astronauts saw, but you'd see Earth the size of a BB held out a couple of yardsticks away from your eyeball. That's 
zero Earth right there, a couple of pixels wide on the screen. So I think that would be quite a mind expanding perspective on how big the solar system is, how small the humans are. I have a little flavor of that from the shuttle just a couple hundred miles away. This would be truly remarkable in terms of human exploration and our, our sense of our place in the cosmos. So I'll wrap up this little subtopic of my talk just by pointing out that we can reach nearby asteroids with rockets that we're planning to build today. It's feasible to do that. Uh, when we go there, we're going to be doing some very new and different science, different from Earth science, different from Mars exploration, different from lunar exploration, because these objects are ancient remnants of the early solar system, four and a half billion years old. And so we'll be bringing back the raw materials of the planets. Uh, we'll also find space resources on them. Some of the asteroids we might visit actually have water on their surfaces. We know that from meteorites that arrive on Earth from objects like these. And as we're trying to get ourselves off this Earth and out into the solar system, we may go back to the moon, we may go to Mars one day. This kind of mission will keep up the momentum as we build up experience on the moon or nearby and then take us all the way out to Mars. We'll learn a lot of lessons going out into space on some small trips like this before we take on a huge challenge of going for Mars one day. And of course, lastly, if we can learn enough to nudge one of these objects off course, that's the right thing to do for the planet. It's good to use our space technology and our investment in that technology to give ourselves an insurance policy for our future survival. Well, back to our dynamic Earth. It's changing because of impact, but it's also changing because of the geologic processes that work here. Here we're back in the Himalayan mountains, and we're going to talk about plate tectonics for a few minutes. The top of the Himalayas here, India to the south, Tibet to the north. And again, erosion fighting with the uplift of this whole mountain range by a continental plate collision. But for the astronaut, there's something more at work here. This photograph actually can teach you on your next space mission, how to find Mount Everest, looking down from Earth. And the astronauts fly by Tibet, we look for this landmark. It's a, a lake in Tibet. I can't pronounce the name of the lake, but to <laughs> all of us here in Houston, it's called Lake Bota. And once we find Lake Bota, you can move the east along the Himalayan front, and you'll look for two very distinctive valleys that are V-shaped right here. Look for this big outwash from uh, the Himalaya front that's going down towards the Ron Kutra. But beyond that river, there are two valleys that form a V right here. And if you look at the longer of those two V-shaped legs, you'll find the head of that valley, Mount Everest, right here. That's how you find Mount Everest when you go up with Richard Branson from the station. <laughs> now, once you've found Mount Everest, then you can get out your telephoto lens and you can get a picture like this. And that's a shot that I took on Columbia back about 10 years ago. That's the summit, six miles above sea level, and of course we're looking down from about 220 miles up. And the head of that valley that I showed you in the previous picture was very good. Well, I was glad I was looking down on shirt sleeves at Mount Everest rather than trying to actually climb it. So. <laughs> Mountains, of course, are created around the world by the process of plate tectonics on Earth. We've got plates that slide around on the, on the, on the lithosphere. Uh, our lithosphere plates slide around on the mantle. And we collide continental plates to thrust mountains into the sky. We uh, have ancient plate collisions right here in our own country. The Appalachians on the left were created by an ancient collision about 270 million years ago when uh, pieces of Europe rammed into the North American plate. And this is a shuttle radar topo mapper image of the Shenandoah Valley here and the Blue Ridge Mountains here. This is called Massanutten, a uh, town called Front Royal that leads over to Washington, D.C found right here. So a beautiful example of the old cores of the eroded Appalachian mountains. If we look across the solar system, the radar image from Venus shows you the same kind of folded mountain belts. So something's going on on our twin, Venus, that looks like, approximately like, the process of plate tectonics. Although we don't find the other elements that make up the entire process here on Earth. But there are a couple belts of mountains on Venus, probably formed by pieces of the crust colliding and crumbling these mountains up. Of course, in other regions of the world, the plates are doing different things. Rather than running head on into each other, they're sliding past each other along the falls like the San Andreas. Here is Los Angeles, uh, the Pacific Coast, and the famous San Andreas Fault. California is going that way about 
30 centimeters per year on average. And when it sticks and then breaks free again, that's when Los Angeles and San Francisco have troubles. Another famous fault that's visible here is the Garlock Fault that uh, together with the San Andreas help us find uh, Edwards Air Force Base. So if your shuttle pilot is lost, look for the airplane faults. You can find your way back to the landing site. Another shuttle took over uh, the map image. Over on the other side of the world, we see in East Africa, the East African Rift Valley, which is a failed uh, spreading center, a place where the plates are breaking apart. <coughs> and new ocean crust is coming up from the interior of the Earth. And there is a triple junction, it's called, in geological terms. The Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and this East African Rift Valley that are all breaking apart and starting to spread and create new crust on our world. This one is actually uh, at a standstill right now. There's not much spreading going on there at all. It runs about 4,000 miles uh, across Africa and up into the Mideast. Uh, but both the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden are opening up. The oceans are getting wider there, just like they are in the center of the Atlantic and over in the East Pacific. So this is the process of creating new crust on the Earth. In other areas of the crust, those plates are being recycled and being driven back into the interior of the Earth. What's going on around the solar system? Over on Venus, we see not only crumbled mountains, but these rift valleys that are created on a scale that's almost similar to those on Earth, mid-ocean ridges on Earth. These rift valleys run from here to here is about the distance from New York, this side of Old Earth. So on a planet-wide scale on Venus, cracks are occurring in the crust, and the crust is pulling apart. Is this creation of brand new crustal material? We just don't know yet. But we don't see on Venus areas where trenches form and the crust is being driven back into the interior. Maybe it's because the crust uh, material on Venus is so dry, the water has been driven out of these rocks by the high temperatures over the last few billions of years. Strangely enough, we look all the way out the other end of the solar system and we see crosses of plate tectonics at work in places where it shouldn't be operating at all. Earth is driven by its interior radioactive heat. Here's the moon of Saturn called Enceladus, and it should be dead as a stone at 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And yet, here's a deep fissure in the crust, evidently where it's pulled apart, and there are lacy fissures in the crust of Enceladus, seen in this image from Cassini, that show us that the the crust is actually breaking apart and spreading on this tiny Arizona-sized moon at the outer edge of the solar system. This image just came out this uh, last month from the HU conference in San Francisco. Here is a typical mid-Atlantic spreading ridge where a crack is driven apart with new material upwelling at the center, and then it's spreading outward with new crust driving out on side of the lift. So that's what's generating new ocean floor on our world. Over here on Enceladus, the Cassini team has just found this pattern of fracturing on that icy world. Or again, the crust is made of water ice at temperatures that make it hard as rock. And you see the same fracture pattern as if the spreading center is occurring there among those tiger stripes on Enceladus. This jumble of fissures here is not similar at all to what we see on Earth. That's a complex story we have yet to unravel. But apparently, the tidal pool of Saturn stretching and then releasing and sell this over and over again. It's generating rifting and then new material is being erupted onto the surface and spreading those tracks. Well, that process on Earth of creating new ocean crust and then subducting plates down below the edges of other continents creates volcanic activity on our planet. Here's a view from the space station of Mount Etna in Sicily where the Mediterranean plate is diving underneath the Eurasian plate and creating outs and also generating volcanoes like Mount Etna. Dramatic view from space that all the astronauts look forward to seeing. This is another shot from the space station of Mount St. Helens in the Pacific Northwest, which erupted in 1980 and blew the top third of the mountain away. And spectacular view of both the devastated zone caused by that recent eruption and the uh, erosion that started to attack the slopes of uh, ash that were laid down by that eruption back uh, almost 30 years ago. So, astronauts are orbiting the planet always look for dramatic images or features of change. We love to see the drama that our Earth presents us. So this is a shot that I saw on my uh, flight aboard Endeavour in 1994 on the eastern edge of Kamchatka. This is the Pacific. This is the eastern edge of Asia. And that's the tallest volcano in Asia called Pluto Sky. And we were on a mission to planet Earth on that flight. We saw this plume of dust or storm clouds or 
volcanic ash. We couldn't tell which until we got nearly overhead the Kamchatka uh, volcanic zone uh, running up and down the spine of that peninsula. And I came upstairs on the flight deck and I heard Mike Baker, our commander, call me upstairs. Come and look at this. When I got upstairs, Baker had his arms full of cameras. <laughs> that only occurred when he was over at his hometown in California. <laughs> but we were over in East Asia, and there was something strange going on with Mike Baker and his camera. So we all got ourselves crowded into the window, and we looked at what was going on here, and we recognized this volcanic zone as being the source of a brand new eruption. It occurred on the very day that we launched the program. And as we came overhead, we were the very day, we looked down on this full blown eruption of Pluto Sky right here. And that ash bloom was going about 60,000 feet into the air. Another volcano nearby, Desiani, was smoky. And you can see the prevailing winds blowing a low level ash, and then the steam cloud the color of the ash lay out of the Pacific. And we watched that eruption unfold for an entire week. It's a fantastic display of our change in growth. Well, the famous volcanoes of the Earth, there are many of them. Hawaii is one that we always look for in orbit, the flows from the top of Mauna Loa. Mauna Kea over here at Roman Volcano, and Kilauea, which is active today. This whole island of Hawaii is only about a million years old, erupted from the seafloor over a hot plume of rising material from the mantle, and formed this brand new island, and it's still building itself out of the Pacific Ocean. There are certainly mountains on Venus, like this one called Mont Mons. It's about eight miles above the, the mean sea level, if you will, on Venus. And this is exaggerated vertically in the shot, but it's a very prominent conical peak, and it looks like from the radar images that we have of it, that there is ash lining the flanks of this mountain. So that would lead you to believe that it's actually been a volcano that's been uh, recently active. The flows from this mountain, lava flows go out several hundred kilometers from the base across the plains of Venus. But we don't really know whether this is an active volcano as a lot of things. We have to await further evidence from landers that will someday go there. We haven't captured Venus in the act. But we have found volcanoes active on this little moon of Jupiter called Io, imaged by the Galileo spacecraft. Here's a volcanic plume above the edge of the planet seen by the Galileo spacecraft a few years ago. This is a straight down view from Galileo at this volcano called Ra Terra. And Io is bigger than our moon, but it still shouldn't be geologically active today. And we know now that because of Jupiter's gravitational tug, the tides there drive the rocks up and down several hundred meters every day, uh, every, every orbit around Jupiter that I emits. And so that constant flexing melts the rocks on Io and that generates these volcanic centers. These flows go about 200 kilometers across the surface. And the lavas that erupt from Io volcano are the hottest that we've seen in the solar system, about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, much hotter than the lavas that come out of the terrestrial volcanoes. Io's got something like 100 of these volcanoes going off at any one time, much more active than Earth in terms of activity per square mile, even in terms of numbers of active volcanoes. Here on Earth, we have about 60 volcanoes that are active at any one time, like those in Hawaii. And for some of my astronaut training, I actually got to go to Kilauea and uh, walk along those lava flows and actually dig a geology hammer into a fresh running flow of Hawaii lava that was oozing out of the ground there. Brand new Earth being created. It was very dramatic and fun to do that. You get too close, your eyebrows just sort of just vaporize. It's a hot of this. Um, on the moon, the Apollo 15 astronauts visit the Hadley Rill, which is another lava channel, much bigger in scale. This one's about 80 miles long, and it's about 900 feet deep. And so this ancient lava channel carved the lava plains of the northern regions of the moon probably about 3 million years ago. But it's kind of about volcanic activity that we still recognize on Earth today that shaped the face of the moon, and also Venus, for example. Over on Mars, which has the largest volcanoes in the solar system, we see large mountains like uh, Terrena Patera here, with a large caldera at the summit. This is a, a volcano that's the size of a small state here in the US. And uh, it's riven by erosion gullies. That tells us that this ash-covered volcano has been subjected to erosive forces by rainwater, maybe snow that accumulated on the surface of the summit, and over the past few billion years, it's eroded the planets of the Terra. The same kind of thing, of course, goes on here on Earth. And as fast as volcanoes are driven into the, the atmosphere, this is Mount Rainier, Washington, 14,000 feet high, the biggest one in the Cascades, as fast as it rises into the sky, 
uh, the action of snow and ice erodes those uh, flanks of the volcano, glaciers up the top, and then run off, carving their way down those flanks of the mountain. It's one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the U.S. because of the danger that these glaciers might suddenly melt with an eruptive episode and then flood all the way out to Puget Sound. A lot of people in the Seattle suburbs are in the way. And that leads me away from mountain building and tectonics, finally, to the destructive processes of erosion in the solar system. And we shouldn't say goodbye to volcanoes yet, but that one more of the story. Um, if you want to go to a volcano yourself, you can go to Hawaii, of course, maybe about a 10-hour trip from here. But there's one a lot closer. Uh, Liz and I, my wife Liz is here, we went to Costa Rica last spring and went to the Arenal Volcano. It's only about 5,000 feet tall, but it's very active. It's active every day. Uh, it's easy to get to. It's about a three-hour flight from Houston. And you can buy about a three-hour trip away from the airport and arrive at the National Park there. This is a 1968 model float. And at night, this mountain tosses red-hot boulders out of the crater all night long. And as you sleep in your hotel near the flanks of the volcano, you can hear the rumbling of the boulders running down the slope. If you've got a tiny slope, you will see that kind of an effect. But it's really dramatic. It's really noisy. And it's really exciting. So I recommend that Aronoff be on your trip list if you want to go to Central America and see some of the rainforests and also the active, uh, the active uh, volcanoes in this region. Well, the Earth is being driven up in some places, and of course it's being torn down by our atmosphere. Rainfall, snowfall, and the uh, cumulative products of wind erosion as well. This is a nice shot from my last show mission of the Grand Canyon, winding its way from Utah here, all the way through Lake Powell, and then down to northern Arizona, and all the way out to Lake Bean near Las Vegas over here. This is uh, the state of Utah. This is Arizona. San Francisco volcanic peaks near Flagstaff here. And this is the heart of the National Park, right here, uh, the south rim, the north rim, and the deep gorge of the Colorado River. Uh, it's only been cutting down through the plateau there for about 6 million years, but in that time, it sliced through 2 million years of Earth history. Grand Canyon is probably the prime example of the activity of erosion operating on uh, the continent. It's the most famous, most dramatic gorge you can to the on the planet. And I've been down the bottom of it as many as you have. And you can see way back in Earth's history by the action, the downcoming action of the Colorado River. It's always going on. If you look around Earth's continents today, for a thousand years of uh, history, the land surface will actually lose about three centimeters in height because of the erosive action of water carrying sand grains, gravel, rocks, boulders all the way out to the ocean. So it's a constant destructive cycle. And all of those sediments leave the highlands and they wind up in the lowlands in a place like Houston, Texas. <laughs> you can see from the shuttle, we're looking at two miles of mud above the bedrock here on the Gulf Coast. And this is all Sedimentary outwash caused by the Trinity, the San Jacinto, the Brazos rivers winding across the plains for the last few tens of thousands of years. And Houston has plunged right down on that coastal plain of sediments. So you have to go a long way down to find the bedrock down beneath uh, Galveston Bay and the barrier islands of Galveston and uh, all of them. So that's home. Not very exciting geologically, except it's a sign of how the Earth dis disposes of those products of the road. A lot more dramatic landscapes out near Death Valley. This is another place I went on a geology training trip, uh, ready for my first uh, couple of shuttle missions. Death Valley is the lowest place in the Western Hemisphere. Hamden Mountains, the Black Mountains, about 10,000 feet above sea level in both cases. And down at the bottom is Badwater, about uh, 150 feet or so below sea level. The alluvial fans that you see here are washed out from the mountains are gravel plains. Again, flash floods grinding up the mountains, sending the debris down into the lowlands adjacent. Over in the volcanic crater called Gubuhidi in Death Valley, right up in this area, you can see on a smaller scale water cutting through the sediments in a very dry place. Most of the change in the landscape here is caused by flash floods that occur infrequently. And yet, water is what shapes this most inhospitable desert in North America. Water is the product that changes the landscape the most. And we see the same process on Mars. Much to our surprise when we first sent our robots there, uh, we looked at Mars and thought it was a dead world at first, but in uh, Organa's house, the chaos here on Mars, we've seen on crater walls very, very familiar looking gullies, apparently caused by running water. We don't know whether it's from an aquifer up on the crater rim or whether there was actual runoff in the last few million years that's caused these gullies, but the 
shape and length of it just tells us that they were caused by water. So Mars has been shaped up and carved by runoff, well, sometimes on a gigantic scale. This is an outburst region, a chaotic region of terrain on Mars. You can see the scale bar here is about 10 kilometers. So the whole scale, maybe a couple hundred kilometers across. Water has burst out of this region of the landscape, and again up in this area as well, and flooded outwards to the lowlands, down through these flood channels. And you can see the islands that were carved by those floods. Those floods, at their peak, were about a thousand times the output rate of the Mississippi River, all occurring at once to carve this landscape in a tremendous flash flood that looped through the landscape here, also escaped through this crater, formed a lake, and then burst down on that so we have flood regions in, on Earth that are like this, but nothing on the scale that you see on Mars. Water is very active in shaping the landscape, both in small valleys and also these giant flood channels. We go all the way out to the edge of the solar system, we see the same process of erosion at work on Titan, the biggest moon in the solar system, uh, the largest one older than Saturn. And it's covered with haze, but the Huygens lander four years ago parachuted through those clouds and took this picture of its landing zone, and you can see the valley networks that exist on this strange world. Again, the temperature is about 300, 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. That's about the same temperature as the liquid oxygen, the oxygen that runs through the shuttling engines. And yet, something has carved the ice crust of Titan into these valley channels, these valley networks. And what's the fluid? It's not water. It's all iron hard here on Titan. It's liquid methane. We've all read about the discoveries that have been made recently with the radar on Cassini. Looking at the surface of Titan, it appears that there's a hydrologic cycle going on here where methane vapor is being erupted from the interior, it condenses, rains out, and carves these valleys, and then eventually ponds into lakes. At the north and south poles of Titan, we see lakes that are as large as our great lakes on Earth, and they're filled with liquid methane and methane, hydrocarbon lakes. So this is a valley network feeding into this one. And uh, of course, they're on the same scale as uh, some frigid lakes that we know on Earth. Lake Michigan, uh, Lake Huron up in the uh, top center. This is Lake Superior, uh, Lake, yeah, Lake Superior, Lake Huron, and Lake uh, Erie in Ontario. That brings me to a, the topic of cold regions on Earth. We've talked about water erosion. We've talked about how destructive that is. That's the main force eroding Earth. But the frozen landscapes of Earth can be neglected, and of course we've got lots of icy places around the solar system. So here's an ice pack breaking up on the margins of one of the ice shelves in Antarctica. On Mars we have polar caps as well. Uh, several hundred meters at least of water ice at their core, and then a larger cap of uh, frozen carbon dioxide. This is uh, the landscape of the Mars south polar cap emerging from winter, and the bare Earth being uh, exposed as the carbon dioxide frost evaporates in the atmosphere so long as away. And the action of ice is visible on Earth in valleys like Yosemite, where the glacier is carved in a U-shaped valley. Uh, looking down from orbit, you can see uh, that same Yosemite landscape. This is uh, Lake Hetchy Hetchy right here. And this is the Yosemite Valley of the Mercer River flowing out towards the west. Uh, this is the spine of the Sierra Nevada and Mono Lake over on the dry side of the Sierra. So, this is a shot that our crew took on STS-59, looking into this most famous of gorges in the Sierra Nevada of Yosemite. Glaciers largely shape that valley. And of course, glaciers around the planet have carved the mountains and broken all the way down to the ocean front. This is a famous glacier called Malaspina on the Alaskan coast. It's very reminiscent of this apparently glacial landform on Mars. And it's called uh, Deuteronomus uh, uh, Mons. And it's a region where we think there's either a buried glacier or the remains of the moraines, the rocks left behind by a glacier retreated or evaporated. And so Mars apparently has been carved by glacial episodes in the past as well. Again, water was once very abundant on the surface of Mars. We'll come back to that uh, near the end of the talk. Let's shift gears to another less obvious erosive force on Earth, but it's one that's very evident around the solar system. Dust lofted into the air by winds in the atmosphere can actually carve the landscape. Here's a, a big dust storm in Iran, near the town of Bam. And astronauts took this photo of the dust storm's origin and then the clouds sweeping up all the way across the deserts of Iran uh, on ISS Expedition 8. 
On Mars, we see very similar dust storms. Here's the Mars North Polar Cap. In the springtime, as the air starts to warm in the temperate parts of Mars, the air starts to rise, and that lets cold air from the poles flood in and race across the landscape, giving rise to these big dust storms that cover hundreds of kilometers, which eventually converge into one that covers an entire hemisphere. And that moving dust, even in the thin Martian atmosphere, that's a thousand times less dense than our own, can actually carve the landscape. These are examples of furrows in the flanks of the big volcano Olympus Mons. It's probably a, these are probably yard ends, just like this one you see out near Edwards Air Force Base, where the prevailing winds will actually erode the landscape into long ridges. You can see these are not very big, they're like 20 feet high. But on Mars, these yard ends, these ridges carved by the wind, can run for hundreds of kilometers across the bedrock of that volcano. Another way that we can see the work of the wind across the solar system is by looking for sand dunes. There's a famous dune field in Algeria called the Tiffany, and it's matched by the exotic but very pretty shark tooth shaped dunes on Mars at the bottom of the crater called Proctor. And there's the scale. These are about as big as a football stadium or so. Um, these dunes on Mars pile up much more slowly because of the thin air on Mars. It might take 75,000 years for the dust driven by the wind into a familiar dune shape. That's only slightly faster than the US Congress works. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're patient, you'll see the landscape changing on Mars, just as the rovers have done in close up. Here's another beautiful set of dunes in Certus Major. These are sinuous dunes caused by wind coming in from two different but varying regularly directions. And they build up these long linear dune fields. Even out as far as tight, where again the temperature is 300 below, we see dunes that are very reminiscent of the dunes in Saudi Arabia, these long linear dunes caused by steady prevailing winds. And in Saudi Arabia, these might be 500 meters tall. On Titan, we think these are about uh, I think 200 meters or 150 meters high, and they stretch for a couple of hundred kilometers in this view. So the winds are very sluggish on Titan. There's not a lot of energy in the atmosphere from solar heating to make the winds move. But Fine material on Titan is being swept up in the dune fields. What's the fine stuff on Titan? It's probably organic soot that's been raining out of the skies. It's a photochemical smog process that's converting methane into soot. It's falling onto the surface in very small uh, particles that can then be lifted by these very sluggish winds. The high winds land are touching down, the winds are only one or two miles per hour on the surface. So this is a long, long process, but it's operating even on a world as remote as Titan. Well, let's wrap up with a little discussion of uh, life. Now, we're curious creatures. We want to know whether we're alone in the universe or in the solar system, certainly. And I have some water, right? I'm glad this is a 300 below. <laughs> We've seen some shuttle photos that show how colorful the Earth is. From this aerial shot, you can see the, the pastels on this landscape on Earth. Uh, these are actually shorebirds in lakes in Africa clouds of white shorebirds and then algae growing in the shallows here. Is this the only place where life exists? You know, on Earth we've had a long history of life. The first cells evolved about 3.8 billion years ago. And you can walk through the timeline of evolution all the way down to our own species, which is a couple of billion years old. And Earth is just swamped with life. Uh, from the deepest gold mines where we find bacteria living within the rocks, the bottoms of the mid-ocean trenches where the temperatures of the waters coming out of the cracks in the earth are you know, about uh, 600 degrees centigrade to the hottest hot springs at Yellowstone National Park. Life hangs on wherever it gets started. A prolific process, and one that's so tenacious, even re-evolving on Earth after probably being wiped out by com comet and asteroid impacts. Would it make sense to ask ourselves whether it ever got started on other worlds? Certainly, that's the reason for us to eventually exploring Mars. Is there life still there today? And we've got some dramatic evidence of how available some of the resources for life are. On Mars, the Phoenix lander found these little chunks of ice in one of its trenches that evaporated by just a couple of days later. So there's subsurface water readily available. You need organic material. That hasn't been found on Mars yet. And you also need an energy source. It can come from the sun, or it can come from the hot interior of the planet, like at the mid-ocean vents on Earth. This larger shot on the left is from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter 
and it's a shot of layered bedrock in one of the large craters called Becquerel on Mars. And these layers were perhaps laid down by liquid water standing there in the past and filling up the crater floor. So if you had a pond of water here millions or billions of years ago, we had perhaps the conditions necessary for life arising and then perhaps even hanging on today. You can think of even more exotic spots in the solar system that at first glance would support life in our imagination, but the moon Europa, circling Jupiter, and was visited by the Galileo spacecraft and Voyagers, and it's carved up by these strange fissures in the icy crust of its surface. At close up, the Galileo spacecraft found not only those fissures, but also these little blips on the surface. They look like little ice volcanoes, places where liquid water is coming out of the interior flooding onto the surface. And if that's true, we might be looking at evidence of that ocean that we think is below the crust of Europa. This crust might be 6 to 15 miles thick, but the water underneath might be quite warm, fed by the tidal heating exerted by Jupiter. We might have a warm ocean, and in particular, we might have something very like the mid-ocean vents on our own Earth, current right on Europa. And there's organic material there deposited by comets and asteroids. There's a heat source. And there's abundant water. Did life get started there? We're going to need some of the young engineers in the audience here to invent a way to melt our way down through six miles of ice at Jupiter and then figure out whether that's really a habitat for life. Even Titan is thought to have subsurface ocean as well as these pools of hydrocarbons on the surface. We know the materials are there, we know the heat source is there, we think the water is in the interior. Maybe there's life hanging on or evolving even as we talk. And of course, we shouldn't limit our search and our discussion of life to just our solar system. We're interested in other worlds. And when I was on my first mission into Earth orbit, there were nine planets in the solar system. Today there are eight. <laughs> I'm still depressed. <laughs> Today, in the galaxy, we know that there are more than 300 extrasolar planets that have been discovered by the techniques in the last 10 years of looking for the tug of unseen worlds on other stars and looking for the eclipses as small planets pass in front of a bright star and then dim its light slightly. So the number of extrasolar planets is up above 300. And our challenge is to find an Earth-like planet, not just a hot Jupiter that orbits so scorchingly close to its sun that it's just being fried. But we're looking for the Holy Grail, which is an imagined planet like Earth circling another star in the sweet spot where the temperature is just right for the existence of life. And so that's our challenge in the future. We're not only going to be exploring the moon and Mars and the nearby asteroids, but we're going to be continuing to search with our biggest telescopes on the ground and in space for that world out there that might be a parallel to our own. And this artist's conception, we might have uh, an imagined Earth circling near or around a larger giant, but we don't know where that future Earth is going to be found. But I think positive we'll find something. And we're about 20 years away from having the telescope technology in space with NASA's future plans to detect objects of that size and then to measure their atmospheres, whether water vapor, free oxygen might be there, the tracers of life on the surface of that world. And I'd like to wrap up with that view of our planet from Apollo 8. This is a Japanese robot shot of our Earth looking back from the south pole of the moon. We're back out there again looking at our own world, and soon I think we'll have people taking in this view once again. And that reminds us that this is the place we started from. This is the textbook that these pages we first opened in exploring our solar system. And the findings that we're making around the solar system are coming back to change the pages of that textbook that we've been studying for the past couple of hundred years. So Earth is a classroom, but it's also the recipient of this new knowledge that we've been bringing in from around the solar system with our robot explorers. And Ellen and I put in, the, uh, in our climatology book a nice uh, line from T.S. Eliot. And he uh, talks briefly about this whole process of exploration and why it's important for us. He says, T.S. Eliot says, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of our exploring will be, be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. That's certainly why we are going out there ourselves in space, to find out more about our own world and where we residents of Earth 
don't think anybody knows the answer to how many stars might have Earth-like planets around them. Uh, what we do know is that planets are pretty ordinary in solar systems or in star systems around the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, the evidence rolls in every week of our telescopes seeing uh, stars surrounded by debris clouds or disks where planets are probably forming just the way our solar system forms after the Most specifically, I mean, would there have to be like a GT star, like our own sun, or other other stars have to move? Planets? Well, it's not uh, it's not so easy to answer that question. Uh, there's a lot of other things that might have to move. We think that stars like the sun and even dimmer and dwarf stars might be the best candidates for life because those stars live a long time. You don't want a big bright massive star to burn out in just a few millions or tens of millions of years, so there's no chance for life. Yes. Uh, knowing what we know about the dynamo effect and the uh, unique set of circumstances that protects us from black cosmic rays, on top of that, a uh, very precious blue line that shields us from the ozone layer, and on top of that, our location within the Milky Way. Uh, which I'm not sure all of those were taken account in the great equation, but maybe they were. What would you say about the odds considering those things? Well, I'm not an expert in, in astrobiology, and I'm certainly not an expert, well, I'm not an expert, but you know, my sense of it is, is that we have 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. 100 billion stars. So it's difficult to imagine statistically that uh, zero other solar systems have life just based on the statistics. And I say that because on our planet, life got started probably about 4 billion years ago. That was during the period of the largest bombardment of the inner solar system by leftover asteroids and comets. Uh, so we think that Earth got sterilized several times during its early history where life began, was wiped out by warming of the oceans by these impacts. And then cranked up again so it seems that with the right conditions, life be, becomes evident no matter how tenaciously you try to wipe it out. And so if that's true in this one example, I would say with that many planets or that many stars to work with, we're going to find life somewhere else. And remember, um, you know, protection from ultraviolet is good for us, and protection from cosmic rays is good for us as human beings and, and of course, surface life on Earth. But we don't know whether life got started on the surface of then down the bottom of the ocean where that shield is also divided by what they're looking for. So it's pretty evident that it gets started once we have the right direction. Right in the back. What is your opinion of the movie Armageddon? <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair question since I brought up the whole impact. Yeah. Uh, I remember when Bruce Willis was making a movie out there at the end of the album. I was really excited. Good news is we don't need Bruce Willis to get very nasty. And Armageddon is just a fun sci fi flick. And it's, it's, it's probably its only redeeming value is that it educates us all the fact that Earth can be struck by our objects. And the good news is that to divert an asteroid, you don't need Bruce Willis to build a nuclear weapon. All you need is a robot spacecraft. The simplest way to do it is just to park next to the asteroid with a two-ton spacecraft and sit there for a number of months. And just a tiny gravity uh, between those two objects will be enough to nudge a small asteroid uh, in the direction of Speed up, you slow it down, and it doesn't arrive at the rendezvous, and it misses the Earth. You have to act a little bit more quickly, or the object is larger, you run into it with a bullet, just like we did with Deep Impact back in 2005. You make a massive object, a spacecraft run into that asteroid, transfer the momentum, again, change its velocity, and miss the appointment with Earth. If it's a large object, now we're talking only 1 or 2% of the entire asteroid population, the least likely case of an object running into us might require nuclear explosive to vaporize one side of the object and jet it in the other direction. But again, that's a very statistically small probability. For the vast majority of impacts that might occur on our planet that might affect us, we can do it with robots, and we can do it with 10 or 20 years of warning, quite well with the technology we have today. We should still be exploring these worlds, these small worlds, to find out their civil engineering properties, their strength, uh, what the rocks they're made of, how to put together, so we know what force to apply and how best and most efficiently we do that. We have some data as far as what we're doing right now as human being species to stay within the organization of planets and the 
Keep our world going well. You're just talking about impact warriors, or are you talking about like, overall yes. stewardship of the earth? Yes. We're doing things right. Is it watching this? Well, all we hear is bad news about what humans, yeah. <laughs> how humans are affecting the earth. Um, I guess it's, it may be a race against time. You know, our, our increase in knowledge and our ability to use the technology that we have that we might develop to counteract the negative effects that our presence here on the earth has. Now, we've been around for two and a half million years, so we have a right to be here just like every other living thing. And of course, we have a very strong survival drive. So my sense of it is, is that um, rather than try to stop our technological progression and our, our development of the world and our, our wish to raise everybody's living standards, rather than try to stop that process, which is very costly, and of course, deny some people the right to have a nice lifestyle, I think we ought to be trying to use our brains, which is our best asset, to figure out the ways to apply our technology. Maybe the space business will help us do that. Help us apply our technology to solve the ecological challenges that we face, and also to evolve to very efficient new sources of energy. We already have nuclear fission, which is a clean source, a safe source, I think, of, of energy for electricity. And we might very soon be able to think of having fusion power, which would get us totally away from fossil fuels forever. And that's the key, I think, is to use our minds to try to uh, outrace the growth of our population and the growth of our evolution, if you will, with the growth of our knowledge. Tom Tuan. Okay. Uh, you, you made a humorous quip earlier, but in all seriousness, after having written and researched this book, uh, research and written this book, uh, you believe that Pluto should have been demoted. With that. Well, I, from our Ben did, ben did our demographic uh, survey over the top, right? So we know that there are some uh, folks here who remember when Pluto was a planet, and there are some who don't remember that it's a planet. Uh, I was certainly going to school at the time, and that's all there were. There were. And I guess from tradition's point of view, I'm in favor of keeping Pluto as an official planet as the representative of all those thousands of other Plutonian objects <laughs> beyond the river of the solar system. Yes, Pluto's one of many others that look just like it. Well, but we gotta have one that we have a name for that sort of plants the, mind, the idea in our mind that that's what's out there at the edge of the solar system. And so I'm in favor of keeping it as number nine. And uh, I think it would just be like a nice place for that whole class of objects. So we can't possibly name all those thousands of Pluto-like objects. So let's just Couple more, right here. Um, yes. I was wondering, I had a very really interesting conversation with a flight talk about the ultimate destiny of the human race and if we are to survive in any long term scale that we must leave the solar system. And this conversation led to discussion of possibly using an asteroid as a safe haven and being able to ride that asteroid in its sunset, if you will and make our way to some other part of the galaxy or out of our solar system at least. What do you think the feasibility or, I mean, that's a bad question maybe to say feasibility, but besides that, are there any other options? And do you think that is something in the future that is going to be looked at seriously? I would say that we have no idea. We can't imagine what our imaginations will someday come up with in the centuries to come. Um, I think I heard Mike Griffin say that when the Vikings were cruising the North Atlantic in 1000 AD, they did not have in mind, possibly, carnival cruise lines. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are, a thousand years later, and that's what's going on on the surface of our oceans. So, why not you know, carve out the interior of an asteroid that protects you from galactic cosmic rays and provides you with all the raw materials that you might need to survive for centuries and send an emissary out there into interstellar space. Probably about halfway to where you want to get to, the humans from a few centuries later will have caught up with their technology and nice body. <laughs> so I'm optimistic about that. And I do agree with uh, Ben's uh, uh, mention early on that only multi planet species survive. And so, you know, we're busy with the current economic crisis and paying our tax bills and our utility bills right now. But, you know, collectively, all of us want to see human beings keep on going 
for as long as it takes. And we never want to be snuffed out like life has been perhaps on other worlds in the solar system. So we want to use our best imaginations to develop the technologies to someday violate the current laws of physics and go away. From what we know now, you could actually do that with an asteroid and with perhaps nuclear propulsion shut off for another star system. You can get there in tens of thousands of years, but some of them are One last question. Who's got the best one? Or at least embarrassing one. Which planet would I like to sample? Uh, I never thought about that. <laughs> we can hold meteorites in our hands, which I think is neat because we're holding the piece of the original raw material of the solar system. We're holding it in our hands. We've all touched the moon rock probably. And that's pretty neat. Nice, but I think uh, I would really like to. Where's the bird? I want to turn the green below zero chunk of ice. I think I would like you know, something from Mars that is a piece of a hot spring on Mars, which I think are still there, uh, with volcanic heat percolating and alternating rocks. And that piece of uh, sediment or deposit on a hot spring might be colonized by bacteria. That might be a very interesting chunk of it. So, with that, I'll thank you again for coming. Uh, I'll see you outside for signatures. Any other questions? And I'll turn it back over to Ben. Great. Let's think top one more